Good evening. Welcome. It's so exciting to see old friends and new tonight. Um, for those of you who haven't met me yet, I'm Al Miner. I'm the founding director and curator here. And it's, this very, it's this such a special evening for several reasons. The first of which is that it's been 22 months since there have been art or artists in this space. And I can't think of a better project to relaunch with than this gorgeous exhibition, Dark Earth, by Teresita Fernandez, and a very special conversation tonight between Teresita and Cecilia Vicuña. We are gonna have a special treat. We're gonna hear two artists, two intellects, two creative minds, give us a little window into their process and let us be the fly on the wall as they have of conversation together about work and ideas. And that's very much what we do here at Georgetown, try to make that connection. I'm gonna give them a brief formal introduction and then welcome them to the stage. Teresita Fernandez was born and raised in Miami. Her conceptual practice includes immersive sensual sculptures, monumental public art, relief panels, and site-specific wall drawings like the one you see here in the Dela Cruz Gallery. She is interested in perception and the psychology of looking and a rethinking of landscape and place, as well as by diverse historical and cultural references. Often referencing the natural world, her work is characterized by a quiet unraveling of place, power, visibility, and erasure that prompts an intimate experience for individual viewers. She is a MacArthur genius, the recipient of many, many awards, and in 2011 was appointed by President Obama to sit on the US Commission of Fine Arts, the first Latina to serve in that capacity. Her most recent outdoor sculpture is on view right now at the rooftop of the Brooklyn Academy of Music. So check that out when you're in New York, of course. And I think there's something very special about this opportunity to have one artist project inspire conversations with other artists and bring even more creative voices into our space and our lives here at Georgetown. Cecilia Vicuña is an artist and a poet who works in many mediums. She was born and raised in Santiago de Chile and has been in exile since the 1970s in New York after the military coup against President Salvador Allende. Her best known works include precarios, small sculptures composed of debris that are meant to disappear, and quipus, monumental installations that create metaphors around weaving, inspired by a forgotten Andean record-keeping system of knotted cords and strings. Her performances emphasize indigenous cultural memory and the collective nature of action to bring forth justice, balance, and world transformation. That is a very Georgetown sentence, so I'm thrilled to share it with you. Cecilia um, has a current retrospective that is on tour and will next open at the Musée de Arte de Banco de la Republica in Bogota in February. Thank you for being here, and everyone help me welcome Teresita Fernandez and Cecilia Fucunia. Thank you, Al, for your generous introduction. And um, thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Um, I think it feels quite new and, and also familiar to all of us. Um, it's such a pleasure for me to be here tonight with Cecilia Vicuña. Um, when we spoke about the possibilities for tonight's event, um, thought of panels and all kinds of other things. And I said, I just want to talk to Cecilia and we don't need a moderator or anything. Um, and so here we are. And so I'm very grateful to Cecilia um, to have this talk with me tonight. And I think that um, it, it's, it's important to me because not only do I have immense respect for her as, as a thinker and as an artist and as a poet, um, but also because I'm, I'm fortunate enough to call her a friend as well. Um, so thank you, Cecilia. And um, so the, the way we're going to structure tonight is to have no structure. Um, we don't know what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes um, talking about the work in the show and just to give a kind of baseline understanding of what my intentions were with this body of work. And then we're just going to talk. Um, so um, this body of work uh, is the Dark Earth series, and it was installed um, uh, specifically for this gallery, but the panel work existed before. And um, to give a brief description of what you're looking at, the, the, the gold, I often use uh, these golden panels that are reflective, 
And uh, this underlying reference of, of gold in my work is always um, referring to the kind of greed that propelled uh, colonization. And we see these, these cycles of gold playing a very important role, um, both in the, the, the colonizing of the Americas, but also what we now call the Americas, but also even um, with the California gold rush. And so there are these cycles of, of this desire for the gold. Um, it also functions as a, as a reflective um, surface where you see yourself. And um, it is my hope that when people look at these pieces that they are engaged in a kind of wayfinding, that they somehow try to find themselves within the distorted image that's in front of them. Um, on the surface is also a charcoal that's built up dimensionally. And um, this is also important. I often use materials that have a kind of intelligence, which means that they come with their own kind of DNA. They come with their own set of, uh, of information. They're not just neutral art materials. Um, charcoal is made from burned trees. So in a sense, I am making a landscape with a landscape. I am using these burned trees to create this imagined landscape, which becomes many places at once. Um, and in this particular body of work, I was, um, you'll see that there's a kind of verticality. I am thinking about many things, including these very subterranean um, geological sense of time, um, thinking of the landscape not just as something in front of you or as though we are kind of actors on the stage of the landscape, but rather the landscape also as being something inside of you and something expansive, something that's way beneath the, the, your feet and, and also extends above you to the cosmos and all around you. And um, at the time that I made these pieces, um, I, I had read a book called 1491. And I had, I had learned about these um, shapes that were found in the Amazon basin. Um, because of deforestation, we can now sort of like on Google Earth or anything, you can, you can look at an aerial view of the Amazon area and you can see the shape of the land, which when the trees were on there, you couldn't see. So it's, it's an unfortunate reason to be able to see these shapes. Um, but what has been found are these elevated raised geometric areas. And what they prove, and um, this is really important, but what they prove is that in fact, at, at the point of European, first European contact in what we now call the Americas, um, there was nothing primitive. Everything was very, very sophisticated. And that these were, these were agricultural societies that had very sophisticated um, systems, uh, elaborate trade routes, and pretty much what we would refer to as urban centers. Um, some of these centers of, of, of uh, of uh, congregation um, were bigger than Seville and London at the time. And so really significant urban um, places that were all communicating with one another. And the reason why this tiny piece of information is so threatening is because it basically turns on its head almost every bit of scholarship that we've, we understand about what is modern. And so this idea that something is modern or that something is civilized hinges and it depends on something being primitive or the opposite, right? You can't have a south without a north. You can't have an evil without a good. And these sort of extremes of binary thinking that inform so many aspects of uh, colonial um, thought. Um, and so the way that uh, indigenous people were making the land fertile, it's very hard for things to grow in the Amazon basin because it rains so much so all the minerals wash away is that they, this is a very humanized, they was a very humanized landscape, right? It was not a wilderness. They were basically creating dirt. They were creating fertile soil. The way they were doing that was through slash and burn techniques. Um, so they would rotate basically what now is being appropriated as permaculture or, or sustainable farming are, you know, ancient indigenous practices, practices that are still um, very much used in many parts of the world. But what it means is that you don't use everything up. You rotate pieces of land, you, you burn things down, you let them regenerate, you move somewhere else. Um, and the, the soil that they were making, which looks very much like the, like the charcoal in the pieces, um, was called terra preta. The Portuguese called it terra preta. The Spanish called it tierra prieta, dark earth. Um, and even today, there are still parts in these sites where you can make a cross section and dig a hole in the ground and find 
out of nowhere these huge chunks of terra preta. So the reason why I want to talk to Cecilia about this today is because when she walked into my studio um, the week after I finished this body of work, I was talking to her about how I was interested in what was deep underground and connecting that with what was in the cosmos, and that I was looking at this time-space continuum um, in this very expansive way. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, well, that is a very indigenous thought. <laughs> and what came out of her mouth was what I thought was my most private process as an artist. And um, I wanted to start there. I wanted to talk about that initial response that you had that was so um, startling to me that somebody could understand so clearly what I thought I was doing in the privacy of my own studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, Teresita, this is such a wonderful thing to, to hear the complexity of how you come into this. But I want to recreate not the moment when I walked into your studio the first time, even though I will come to that, but I want to recreate the moment of walking into this room today. You know? As everybody knows, we are today and tomorrow is the last day of COP26 when humanity has a chance. Are we going to meet that chance of stopping the destruction of the biosphere of this planet through greed? And that's what you're talking about here, you see? So this feeling of not being understood, not being heard, not being seen, is universal to indigenous peoples. So even though you probably never thought of yourself as an indigenous person, you are one, you know? And your art says it. Says, says it in spades. It says it to me viscerally, instantaneously, like a bah, you see? And that's you. And it's you, but it's a collective you. The suppressed, squashed, aplastado, you know, the buried voice of all of us, not just the indigenous, but all of us, the mestizo. Most likely you are mestizo too, I am a mestizo. So I walked into this room and I see El Carbón. I mean, how many artists have embedded their dirty souls and hands like you have into carbon, charcoal. This cosmos is made with carbon. You know, we are carbon. And yet we think carbon is there. You see, and that reflects really the worldview of the West. That worldview of saying that things are there, materials are there, is the exact opposite of reality, is the exact opposite of truth. And that's why we're killing everything. That's why there may be no humanity if we continue with this idea. And I walk in here and you have not only put your hands, your body, your soul, your breath, full of charcoal. I can only imagine you, and perhaps I should stop speaking and let you speak of how you did this, but I don't know if this happened to you all that are here. First thing I see is el pelo, you know, like the charcoal became despeinado. And what's the word? Despeinado, like your hair got, <laughs> you know, again. You see, <laughs> To speak of Teresita, you have to make noises. <laughs> There's no other way. Because you are exploding it from under. Because you get under it. You get inside of it. So the inside of your soul, of your being, and the inside of charcoal become enmeshed. And that's what we feel walking in here. That's what I felt in your studio. But I want to stop for you to tell us what you were experiencing doing this piece. Hmm. Um, well, I want to get to that. Um, 
because it was actually very emotional for me to do this drawing in here. Um, and I, and I, I want to talk about why in a little bit. But as you were talking, I was reminded of a Hindu myth that I love, which is that um, baby Krishna is crying and crying and crying, and he's driving his mother nuts. You know, she's just like so impatient. She can't figure out why the baby's crying. And she can't get him to stop, and she's just like at the end of a rope. And all of a sudden, he cries even louder, and he opens his mouth. And she peers inside his mouth and sees the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And she is shocked and quiet and humbled at the realization that the entire universe was in her infant's mouth. And I always remember this, um, not only because it's a beautiful myth, but because we often think, as you say, uh, we think of things as inanimate objects, you know, charcoal, bottle, you know, chair, um, bay. Um, I'm remembering uh, if anyone's ever read Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a wonderful book. In it, Robin Wall Kimmer has a, a chapter called The Animacy of Language, where she talks about how um, the rupture of not remembering the names of things and how, for example, when you say a bay, it takes out the, the, the original Indigen her indigenous language would have referred to it as being a bay, not a bay as a solid object. Um, but it reminded me of like this, this sense that we, we like to think that these things are outside of us. Um, the landscape is one of the sort of things that we love to fetishize as being outside of us. We like to think of ourselves as being in the landscape rather than of the landscape. And so, and so this notion that the notion that, that, like Krishna's mouth, that the landscape, in fact, is inside of us too, is, is something that I carry with me and that I try to actually understand because, as, we, as you said at the beginning, there's a, sometimes a way of um, not really knowing how it is that we know something. And sometimes we know something, but we don't know how we know. And it's a kind of remembering. It's a kind mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. truth that you touch and that you understand and which in some way, shape, or form, everyone in this room has experienced as, as, a, as a somatic kind of thing, where you just know that something is true, right? You recognize it. Um, uh, I think that there's, there's so many, um, you know, I'm thinking too of like in, in, in Bantu Congo cosmology, which informs so much of um, Afro-Cuban syncretic religions, um, there's a symbol, a dikenga, which is it's the four cardinal directions, kind of like an alchemical process. And you have, you know, northeast, southwest. And then the last, the last direction, the fifth direction, is actually inward. You know? And it's the hardest one. It's the hardest one to sort of understand. It's the hardest one to enter. And the idea that when you enter that final direction, what you get is the outside again. You get this immense cosmic thing that, that is you, mm -hmm. you know, in the way that you describe carbon. Um, so when I, um, when I did this piece, you know, I was, I was thinking a lot about what it really means to make something site-specific. And um, it's a word we kind of use very casually in the art world, right? We think it means in situ, right? We do something here. And because my work is about really trying to see the parts of the landscape that we normally don't think of as landscape, like the inside of ourselves, um, or what's you know, 100 feet below us, or at the bottom of the ocean, or a faraway star, um, I was engaged in doing this drawing, and I, 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 I was trying to understand where I was you know, in this site-specific drawing, and really trying to um, to, to, to grapple, I think, with the hauntedness of this place where we're in right now. And, and not just this place, many places, right? I feel this in Brooklyn, too. Um, you know, we know that, that, that this, the land that Georgetown sits on, this building that we sit on right, in right now, you know, sits on um, land that was stolen from Piscataway indigenous people. We know mm -hmm. that this entire campus would not exist um, if it weren't for the Jesuits selling human beings, enslaved human beings, and how 
so much of what we think of as this landscape is built by indigenous and, and, and black people who were not thought of as humans. And so that is informs mm -hmm. the site specificity of this drawing. It is not just looking at elevations and laying something out as though it's a model because mm -hmm. that's the size of the gallery. It actually implies that you have to understand where you are, that there's a kind of wayfinding exercise that requires mm -hmm. that you find your coordinates within the heaviness of all of that, right? And lots of other things, right? Because the more you peel back, the more you find. Um, and how there's a kind of responsibility to ask ourselves, you know, where we are with more intention. Um, and I, I hope that that's what I'm trying to do with the work. Like that is, that is what I think I'm doing when I'm, when I'm in the studio. Mm. Yeah. Well, that going down, as you say, is the hardest thing because we are taught in this culture to move away from death, move away from the acknowledgement of pain, the acknowledgement of the pain we cause to others, the pain we cause to the earth, and even the word human. How many people in this room would know, for example, that the word human originates from woman? Woman, not woman meaning female, but actually in the ancient dictionaries that go back to Proto-Indo-European roots, you find that it is spelled with ju, g, g as in gan, you. And what does it mean? It means of, humus, of soil. So the word human means of the earth. Did anybody know that before I said it? You wouldn't know it, you see, because that archaeology of the pain of slavery and the destruction of the indigenous peoples of this land, you can also do that archaeology with your thoughts, with your dreams, and with the words you speak, you know. And uh, these words that we use, practically everything that we name, carries this story of colonization and of transformation of the meaning of words. Words themselves, the way I perceive or see them, as if they were entities, you know, living structures that have been created and exist and are continually transforming. And as you interact with them, new transformations are occurring. That's what you're doing with El Carbón, you know? How are you treating carbon not as something that's outside of you, but that involves all this pain? Now I can say that when I first saw these works in your studio a few years ago, when you were doing them, perhaps not so many years. How many years? Two, three years? I think two, right before pandemic. Just two years. Sorry. Look, it seems like it was a long time ago because of what we have lived with COVID and so forth. But I remember seeing these, and the first thing that came into my mind was something that here, there's a person in the room, that's Tom Cummings. You would know what I'm speaking about. For Tom is a scholar of, of Andean thought forms and art and culture, someone that I read with tremendous passion and, um, and admiration for what he saw. And he and many other scholars have seen that, for example, in the perspective of Andean people, Andean people are not just in this reality which has a name called Este Mundo, Kai Pasha, but they live in at least three realities. But in truth, those three realities interact with each other continually, permanently, in ways that we may be aware or not aware. So whatever is abajo, down below, that's Green Pasha, is also Hanan Pasha up there. So I could see this relationship in you where the ancient 
core of the earth, the charcoal, the carbon that made this cosmos, and the starry heaven, all of it, all the cosmos is <laughs> again a noise, you see, for you. <laughs> and then you come in this room, <laughs> it's raining. Is it it's raining charcoal? I mean, is it going up or is it going down? It's going both ways, you know. And those both ways are just a perception, just as you say, because it's really moving in so many ways. And we are part of that music, that part. And I cannot conceive how can we be alive and not be in awe and in total reverence for that magnificent reality. And yet, we don't think of it that way. We use it. We consume it. We kill it. And I think that is where you're coming from, the acknowledgement of that. How can we be such murderers? You know, and I was thinking when I was on the way I, today, I was brought here as an object in a way, inside a car for four hours, like a prisoner inside a car. What do you do in a car for four hours? Think bad thoughts. And so one of these bad thoughts, of course, is of go back to COP 26. Are they going to bring up the fact that we, all of us present in this room, are complicit with this destruction? This destruction that is here is not happening only in this land, not only in the Amazon. It's actually happening. Our money is causing it because our money is being invested in the destruction of the forest of the whole planet. Do we all know that? That all our banks are doing that with our permission mm -hmm. and we let it be? I mean, my hair stands on end, just like you are painting, just like you are drawing. It rains pain. But it is so beautiful, you know? So we still have the beauty, the sense of the beauty. And what else can guide us to turn around, to, to care for it, you know? To feel it. That's what your art tells me. It's, it's, always, um, it's always very funny to me how human beings use the expression real time. Oh, this is happening in real time. And I, I'm very interested in the way you talk about time and how the ancient and, and the future, the ancient and the futuristic, the, the, the subterranean and the cosmos, the, the behind and ahead are all they're all happening simultaneously. I mean, mm -hmm. we know this, and certainly we, we, in more recent times, have scientific confirmation. You know, they just call it quantum physics, but it's the same thing. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that sense of time, because I think that part of why we kind of are complicit and OK is because we have a very warped sense of time, mm -hmm. of somehow not having to deal with something that happened before us and to really grapple with it and sit, but also that we don't have to worry about anything in the future as long as it doesn't affect us. And so this sense of time as being these like fixed things um, or even definable things, it implies that um, we somehow aren't affected by it or that mm -hmm. things can be deferred. Um, I was hoping that you could elaborate a little bit on that because I thought that was really interesting. You are a bad point. girl, huh? <laughs> you are always a bad girl. And yes, put me on the spot to speak about one of the subjects of which no one knows anything. Because <laughs> the more people, and especially astrophysicists, and I'm always in touch with what astrophysicists are writing or saying or doing, and because I find that their quest is one of the most poetic things that's happening right now in this world. And there's a lot about this time. 
But the way I go about it is like this. I remember I was an, a, a young student at, in the architecture school in Santiago, Chile. And so I may have been 17, 18 at the most at the time. And I was in a class of mathematics with all these 400 architecture students. And finally, I had the realization that time didn't exist. And so the professor Vicuña says, you are thinking of something else. What is this equation? Da, 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 da. Wow. And, and I said, I'm sorry, professor. I just realized time doesn't exist. And the whole, <laughs> the whole room exploded in laughter. The professor was so angry. He said, you are making fun of me. Out. So I had to leave the class. But it is true that I suddenly perceived that time was not what we thought that it didn't move in linear ways, but it also moved in linear ways. And that is what quantum physicists are saying now, that there are so many forms and kinds within time itself that you cannot say there is linear or nonlinear because both are taking place at the same time. So what does that word time really mean? In the root, the Proto-Indo-European root is tem. What does tem mean? Cortar, to cut. So it is a continuum that means to cut. How about that for mm -hmm. a riddle? You see? So we are a riddle. Language is a riddle. And so this riddle, I'm hearing an echo. Do you hear the echo when I speak? It's probably the mic. In any case, this riddle, for me, for example, in the Andean sense, what are riddles? Riddles are cosmic events where, for example, young kids um, perfect the art of making sexy riddles. Because the better they are at riddle making, and I learned this from Gilly Bean Isabel, someone that you probably knew, Tom, a person that I also admire. She died recently a wonderful American um, working class anthropologist, so enlightened. And Billie Jean uh, wrote a beautiful essay about this, observing how kids would riddle. And the consequence of this riddle making is that you are completely aware of something that you said a few minutes ago, which is that you don't know anything. And yet with that, within that not knowing, there is another kind of knowing taking place. And that is erotic. It's sexy. Mm -hmm. And so these kids who are good at riddles are affecting the fertility of the cosmos. Isn't that a fantastic? Mm -hmm. you know? Beautiful. Uh, and it is not a metaphor. It is an actual reality. And I stop there because when I start on that route, I can go many places. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, but it, it's very interesting because we 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 have a hard time seeing ourselves as part of these bigger systems of reality. We somehow see ourselves outside of them. But um, you know, when you think of like how a seed, how an acorn is the archival memory of an entire forest or something that was there thousands of years before it, something that may not exist anymore. Our own bodies have that same quality of being archival repositories mm -hmm. of our ancestors, of everything that really comes before. Um, and so, of course, it's erotic because, you know, we, we, uh, we like to think that, you know, like if you take the word somatic, right? So the whole study of somatic, which means of the body, um, is, is, a, is something that had to be invented with the rupture of colonization to be able to say that this is, a, this is the mind and this is the body, as though they're separate, when in fact everything that we experience, everything that we know is somatic, right? By nature, culture is somatic. You know, dance and music and poetry and visual, it is all of the senses, which means that it is all of the body. And so, of course, it's erotic as well because these are the instruments with which we are the landscape 
and the landscape is us. It is literally the only thing we have to understand any of it, to give any of it any sort of relational meaning. And so that I, I had never heard you talk about that, but that it's a really beautiful <laughs> analogy of the, the riddle making and, and the connection to the erotic and the cosmos. And the, the, the idea, like to, to put it in other words, it's almost like we are antenna. Mm -hmm. You know, we are antenna, we are receptors, and we are, um, our bodies are what the information moves through, you know, yeah. what, what creates meaning in that. But let's, for example, to put things going around, like colonization. This colonization of the mind is not only of the West towards the indigenous, the colored people, meaning us. No, it works also inside mm -hmm. of every white, brown, medium-sized person in the world, you know? So I can tell you a story that the first time I talked about this in public was, I can tell you, it was in the year probably 1972, more or less, in London. I was having an exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Art. That's a very rare thing that a young girl from Latin America would have an exhibition there. That's another story of how did I ended up having an exhibition right there. 1972, no, 73 was my exhibition, sorry, correction, 1973. So I was invited to give a talk. And so I said, well, I'm going to give a talk about the revolution that's going on in Chile. This was the Salvador Allende years, was the most beautiful thing that we had ever experienced. And so there is a small crowd, just as now. And I begin to speak, and what did I say? I say, well, in Chile, there is this extraordinary practice, and I." discuss many of the things that were my version of the revolution in Chile. But one of the things that I think touched a nerve was I, I um, described a ritual that used to happen, doesn't happen anymore, because colonization now is 10 times more brutal than it was in the 70s. But this ritual consisted in people gathering everybody, just anyone, would come to the beach and everybody would make love in the beach. Why did they do that? Because they wanted for the seashells to become more plentiful. So the more fun was taking place in the beach, the more seashells would produce fantastic molluscs for people to eat. <laughs> to me, that made complete sense. <laughs> what happened when I said this? I was removed my British Councillor Scholarship because I was doing something that I shouldn't. So the repression of that eroticism that is of a different order of eroticism. You see, so you have pornography to cover up for the repressed feelings in the West. And at the same time, you have another kind of subtle, profound, monstrous repression of what you just said. This sense that everything is erotic, a seed is erotic. Everything is in this play of delight. And so what would it take for us to recover this absolute sense of delight? We are here for enjoying being here. You know, mm -hmm. Something so, that is primitive, but primitive in the sense of being the primary sense of life, you know? not primitive as something worse than Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way of um, amplifying that sense of the human, of the earth, and the pleasure, and how we can also talk about the grief, mm -hmm. you know, because there's a kind of you know, in those expressions of this kind of, uh, I don't know, communion, for lack of a better word, 
there's also a kind of inherent grief in it, a kind of mourning mm -hmm. that is also recognizable, just like the pleasure is. Um, both mm -hmm. things connected to that being of the earth, being human. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. The denial of total delight is totally equivalent to the denial of total pain, you see? But we have that capacity. A baby is born with that capacity for horrible pain and absolute joy. So this is what makes us be. This is what we have evolved for. And so, I mean, is always come to the same question. What does it take for us, each one of us, to become aware that the time is now? Mm -hmm. You know, and you had, while all this was happening in Glasgow, and I already speak of it in the past, even though we have one more day, we, you see, I, I am connected with that. I suppose many of you in this room feel connected to that, understanding that so much depends on this. And this sense of beauty in the streets, you know, all these people, I don't know if you've seen the, of course you would not see it in the New York Times, but you see it in Instagram, you see it in social media, like thousands and thousands of people dancing in the street, you know, asking, inviting to dance, inviting to bring again this joy of the fight, you know, I remember that when I was a young girl, and this was this democratic revolution happening in Chile, the, perhaps the only revolution without persecution for the one who thinks the opposite of what you think. There was this sense of delight, that the delight was struggle for justice was not a duty. It was just something so beautiful. And I have seen these expressions in indigenous communities in the Andes, that the beauty is the struggle. So it's not the struggle right. and beauty, but beauty is the struggle, or the struggle is beauty. Yeah, and the idea that we don't have to choose. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know one of the things that I focus on so much in the language that leaves my studio and press releases, like there's this constant maintenance that happens in either the fetishizing on how something looks, oh, this is beautiful and beautiful, or something needing to be exclusively political, social political in its content, and how there is such a resistance to the idea that not only these things coexist, but that they're essential to one another, mm -hmm. that, that it is both about the poetry and the politics, and that it is both mm -hmm. about you know, the, 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 the content and the feeling. You know, um, and I think that it is something that we have been, have had so conditioned out of us, you know, to separate the thinking part uh, from the feeling part, that we have to really try, we have to really be aware to kind of choose it. Because when we understand something, without any kind of translation, it, it leaves a pretty indelible effect on us. You mm -hmm. know, it leaves a pretty indelible mark. We recognize it. We actually recognize yeah. when something is that. Yeah. Imagine what you're saying is so basic. Like, for example, we like something. Why don't we stay with that like? For example, now there is this new science that is so fascinating. It's called epigenetics. And we used to hear that your genes contain the information and would rule over who you would be. A lot of people believe that. There was even a scientist who believed in the selfish gene and things like that. And well, very well, it turns out that all that ain't true. That there is something called epigenetics, and I cannot explain it because I'm not a biologist, but I basically understand something that may be wrong, again, because I'm a poet, not a biologist. <laughs> but what I understood is that when the baby is in the mother's tummy, the likes 
and dislikes the pain, the grief, the rage that the mother feels affects the baby in such a manner that the genetic information that the baby is receiving is transformed by the experience of being in the mother's womb. I read that and I thought, my God, how can that be so important that, you know, people don't have awareness. Women who have babies in their womb don't have awareness. The people who are around the mother to be don't have this awareness that they are creating the future potential or the future, you know, wounds of this baby by the way people are treated, the way you treat each other. So all these very primary basic things are the ones that contain most potential of transformation. And it's everything so uh, part of us, you know, it's not something that you have to reach for, it's right there. And I don't know, I, I have the feeling that we're becoming a little repetitive with this <laughs> well, notion. Well, I wanted to talk about something else that we often re return to in our conversations, um, which is about the fact that we met only a few years ago mm -hmm. and that we immediately sort of recognized one another. Mm -hmm. But um, there's, you know, I wanted to talk about visibility and about the power of visibility and, the, and, and how all those suppressed things have, have no shape, including rage, right? Which we can talk about too, because I think that rage is, merits its own conversation, mm -hmm. um, especially in conversations between women. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I had, no, I had no mentors. Like when people ask me, who are your mentors? I had no women mentors. I, had, I didn't know you. I didn't know Amalia Mesa Baines until a couple of years ago. I literally had no women artists, certainly not Latinas, that I even knew existed, you know, mm -hmm. that, I, that I had some kind of contact with. Um, and I think that this is important because when we talk about this kind of continuity and this, this idea of like the futures that get created and the way that knowledge is, is, is passed on between people generationally, that rupture, that violence, because it is violent, you know, one of the most violent things that happens is that, in fact, we don't know one another. We don't even see one another. We're not even in the same spheres. Um, and I think that, I mean, it's just, it's such a gift to even just be sitting here with you because here today, because I feel like we are different sides of the same story in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that there are other people in that kind of continuum. Um, but can we talk about that a little? Because, you know, mm -hmm. You waited a long time mm -hmm. for people to see what you believed and had been giving form to in a very passionate and deliberate way for many decades, you know? Yeah, in, in terms of my experience, I can tell you that I am so old that in the 60s, um, I was a teenager when I began publishing my poetry. First, my poetry came into the world rather than my art. Not that I always did both, but it was the poetry that first circulated. And in the 60s, when we didn't have internet or anything, I published a set of four or five poems in a Mexican magazine. And somehow, this how did this information get dispersed? I don't know. But all of a sudden, poets around the world were reading each other somehow, don't ask me how, because this was a tiniest little magazine, somehow it got around, and I got the sense that my poetry was seen, was perceived, and you would have amazing poets like Yevgeny Yevtushenko, for example, arriving in Chile and saying, I want to meet this 18-year-old poet. It was something astonishing, you know? So I was first seen. Then the military coup came, and I became totally and absolutely invisible for more or less almost 50 years, you know? So I did experience being part of the ability of people to spot each other, because the 60s were like that. You see, the 60s was 
a field of openness and a field of exploration, a field of not knowing where everything was possible. It was just really tremendous to be part of that. And then the 70s and the brutal repression and the dictatorship and the horrors came in and Cecilia disappeared completely. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you about this invisibility that when the opening night of the radical Latin American women artists mm -hmm. took place, I have often told this story because I think it's very telling. We are in the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles and it was a tremendous experience to arrive and there was a line going around the block of people who couldn't get in the museum because it was too crowded. How did Latin American women become appealing? I had never seen that before, <laughs> you know? And I see this crowd, fuck you, so fantastic, this crowd, young people, you could kiss them all. Well, anyway, I finally got in. I was in a wheelchair at the time. I was with my dear friend, Anna Stothard, who pushed the wheelchair into the crowd. Finally, I am inside the exhibition. And all these Latin American women artists, and I suddenly realized, my God, this is how many artists? 50 artists? I don't know the number, but let's imagine it's 50 women artists. I realized I probably knew five of them. And so there we were saying hello to each other, and I was the one who voiced. I said, sorry, I want to say that I had never heard of most of you. Me too, me too, me too. <laughs> All of us experienced the same thing, and yeah. we were quiet because there's so much shame attached in this society to not being known. I have to tell you that while I was not known, I was the happiest person in the world. <laughs> I was never, oh, when they're going to see me. Fuck you, no. Nobody <laughs> would see me. I couldn't care less. Why? Because I was oriented to this notion that you're working for the sea. You're working for what lives, you know, and it's part of being old that you read since you are 15, that all women have been suppressed for at least 10,000 years. Yeah. So I took notice that I was a woman. <laughs> so you were prepared to never be seen again. And when this shift happened and I suddenly, for reasons unknown, became visible again, I really attributed it to the young girls to the young girls who are really involved in a fantastic revolution around the whole world. And it's not that the, the young girls, it's also the trans people. Mm -hmm. It is also the, the gays of every uh, definition. It's also the people of color, of every possible color, and all the mixed people. It's really a transformation going on right now. And the most visual expression of that is, for example, even in countries so repressing, repressive and backward as the US, suddenly people wanted to approve gay marriage, for example. For me, that is a sign that something has shifted. Mm -hmm. So it's just this shift is happening. We just have to, you know, continue in that caminito, in that little road of shifting towards a kind of love or tolerance and receptivity to the beauty that's going on between all of us. Yes. Yeah. Um, shall we open up to some questions? We have time for a couple, and I know the artists made a request to hear from students. I see my entire class <laughs> in the back row. <laughs> Um, can we start there? Do any students have a question for our artists? Thank you both, by the way. That was very special. Um, <laughs> my class also knows that when they don't ask questions, I, I will step in. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> You're gonna let me, ah, uh, Stephanie's gonna be my student for the evening. I'm gonna ask you all to wait till the microphone comes to you and then I'm just gonna hand it over. 
Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to listen to you. It's, uh, it, it really was, as Al said beautifully, as if we were listening in like a fly on the wall. You have such a nice, comfortable rapport. And I was amazed to hear, Teresita, that you, you don't think of yourself as having mentors. It was re really a fascinating idea. So I wonder, what was that moment when you first met? Did you know of each other's work or did you meet each other and then it all sort of uh, became visible. So I'm just wondering, because you, it seems as if you've known each other a very long time, but I think, Teresita, you, you revealed it's actually not been quite so long that you've known each other, if, it, if you don't it, mind sharing. Well, you know, we'd have to go back to the time conversation, and Cecilia, maybe you can have put in your version as well, but when we met, we actually realized that we already knew one another. It was the first thing that happened, but um, uh, we uh, are represented by the same gallery in New York, Lehman Maupin, gallery. There's David. Um, and we actually met at the opening of the new space where there was a gathering of all the artists. And we just, there's actually a picture. It was, it's very funny. It's a little, it's a little corny, but um, it, it sounds really corny. It didn't feel corny at all. But there's a picture of all the artists together. And Cecilia and I are off to the side. And we just held hands. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and that's so that's true. the group portrait of, of, the, of the artists on that opening night, which was a big celebration, we're just holding hands. It was the strangest thing in the world. It wasn't planned or anything, but, but there we were. And it, it, it really did feel like we knew one another. Oh, I love you, Teresita. It was love at instant. ¿Cómo se dice love a primera vista? Um, it was love at first sight. Yes. And I, I'm going to concur. Um, it really was. It's true that we immediately sort of had this feeling and we were attached to each other, it was very mysterious. But I have to say that for me the story is slightly different because I, <laughs> uh, not that moment, I shared that moment, that's true. But I spotted you long before you spotted me. And there's a very important reason for that, which is that you are a Miami girl. And somehow you are part of a whole universe of Latin people that have asserted themselves in this culture in a new manner. So because you are young, you are in that generation of people who came with tremendous force. Instead, I experienced a tremendous aloneness. So when I first saw your work, I thought, who is this Teresita Fernandez? Because uh, your art was so, um, uh, how can I describe it in a manner that would not do damage to the, what, what I felt? It was so sensitive and almost impossible what you were doing. You know, it was like on this edge of being uh, unlike anything that you associate with Latin art, anything that you associate with any kind of thing. Your art was something else. So I became very intrigued as to who was this lady who had a name that didn't coincide with the usual description. You see what I mean? Mm. And that attracted me. So I was aware of your work mm -hmm. before. And I also have to say that Teresita was, you've been with this gallery for a long time, haven't you? Over 20 years. Yeah. yeah, 20 years. I only entered the gallery three years ago. So that also tells the story. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic gallery. It's also represented here. And I am... But, just... but the, the, and you know, the background to this is that None of us knew about Cecilia's work until the mm -hmm. Radical Latin American Women Artists Show. Um, yeah. And it was, the first, it was like that. It was like, I didn't even, and I, I, was, I was so angry. I was like, why was I studying Smithson? Why was I studying, you know, Donald Judd? I mean, why do I know more about Rothko, who was, by the way, an immigrant and, and came when he was 15 years old. And I don't know anything about all of these women who have all of these experiences that were very similar to the ones that had shaped me. And I, there I, was rage. There was like, this is what I should have been. There, I wasn't alone. This feeling of like, and it is, you know, it is a kind of human feeling of exile that we generally all have. But there was, a, there was a, a kind of disdain for the fact that it isn't just that I didn't know you or that I hadn't seen this, but that some force, something, and lots of things actively, you know, erasure is never an accident. It is always a mm -hmm. deliberate act. And so the realization of that actually manifested in me 
as a kind of rage, which is probably why you perceive me as young and forceful. In fact, I was like, you know, this can't keep happening because definitely I'm not the first person to experience this. And yet it always feels like we're reinventing the wheel again or like there, someone has to kind of be this, um, I don't know, this, 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 this sort of like, you know, sacrificial lamb that becomes like the first person. It's like, no, there, in fact, there's a long, long history of which, of course, yeah. Um, you are an important part of, as well as many other people before you. Yeah, I can tell you that what you're saying is so true, and so sharp, so, so important. I wrote sometime in the 80s that the way that history was being constructed is that South American or Latin American history erased itself, and the history of the North erased us. So we were sort of doubly erased. Mm -hmm. What this translated to is that, and I experienced this seeing the work of the Latin American uh, radical show, most of the women in that exhibition had experienced the same thing as I did. You know, some of us were, uh, you know, never uh, ever acknowledged in our own countries. I was never acknowledged for, I always, I, not always, but very often I had this experience that young American girls suddenly studying, let's say, at Bard or some curatorial school here, and they would suddenly see my name, this is some time ago, and they were from Chile, they were from South America, and they asked the same question, how come that we've never heard of you in Chile? I was never, and to this day, I'm probably not even taught in Chile. So why is this sort of colonization of the mind of the own people colonizing themselves. You see what I mean? Is that in the art schools in Latin America, do they study their own art? Not really. So this shift is happening now. For example, now I, I can hardly breathe because these universities in Chile are suddenly, you know, oh, Cecilia has to come speak here. Oh, yes, of course, I'd love to, but wow consider that I'm an old woman now, so I don't have a lot of energy, but still, it never happened before, you see? So there is, that's what, when I say there's a beauty happening, I don't mean it's, it's, of course it's wonderful that's happening in this, but what it means is that the people over there, the young girls are taking it no more, you know? And there's another revolution going on right now in Santiago, in the whole of Chile. There's going to be elections this week, presidential elections. And it is the young people driving the boat in Chile now. Mm -hmm. That had never happened before. Mm -hmm. And who drove that boat? The young schoolgirls. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who, in Spanish we say, la punta de lanza. They are the ones who jump the turnstile. These are the ones who come to rally naked. I painted rallies of naked girls in the 70s. It was a fantasy, of course, I had never seen that. When finally I see this happening in the streets of Chile, isn't that something? Mm. So you see, you paint something, you write a poem, and the poem acts. The painting acts. How does it do it? Just as you say, we don't know, but it does it. So thank you, Teresita. I, I really you. admire you. I admire you. And <laughs> this is so beautiful. Thank you. I think we have one more question. I have um, a question for both of you. Since um, we have our students here, I thought maybe one of, uh, or both of you can give them uh, words of wisdom, advice, you know, they're young, uh, they have the whole lives ahead, and, you know, you've learned great lessons through time, so any words of wisdom and advice that you have for these wonderful students? Um, my advice would be very simple, and it would be to depend on your own intuition more than anything else. Um, for the most part, and no disrespect to Al, but <laughs> for the most part, you, you will spend um, a lot of time trying to unlearn everything that you're learning in school. And that's 
that's fine. It's not either or. It's like you can do both. You can learn it, you can unlearn it, or you can just bypass it. But um, I think that the the intuitive part was the hardest thing for me to hone. And in fact, it was the most powerful part because what you know, you know almost instantly. It's all the covering up that happens afterwards and the second guessing and the applying other you know, uh, ways of measuring things or determining if things are worthwhile. Um, and so I think that the most valuable thing is to know yourself. And that requires spending time with yourself. Um, and yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have great words of wisdom. I think that I'm still trying to figure it out, which is the other thing is like you think you arrive, you know, you see somebody else and you think that they've arrived, but the truth is that you never arrive. You're, you're, you're still every single moment trying to figure it out. It just looks different from different perspectives. Amen. I could say yes, absolutely. What Teresita says is completely true in every regard. And I would say, I would add to that, that one of the most difficult things to do is to listen, you know? But listening is an art that we in this culture have to discover. is the central art of all our cultures. It has always been so. And is the central core of all living creatures to listen to themselves and to the environment, to each other. But in terms of if you are a woman artist, or if you are a young artist of any denomination, to listen to that part of yourself that is suppressed, that you are ashamed, that you despise, that is the key. To listen, likewise, to the people who are despised and ignored, such as your old grandma, or such as your old uncle, or such as the guy who picks up the garbage. Mm -hmm. You know, listen to what you're not supposed to listen to. And you will discover dimensions that you wouldn't know would be there. Do you want to take one final question from a student? Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Amy, and I would just like to thank you for welcoming us into this intimate setting and allowing us to sit in on your conversation. But one question I had was about your process for doc art, and it is, where do you start with an artwork, and how do you know when it's finished? <laughs> um, so I start by reading a lot and researching, and sometimes I start by just walking a lot and sometimes I start by just having like some really good matcha tea and that's how I start. I start by starting um, and starting can look all different ways that don't look like art making. Um, uh, and I know that something's done when it doesn't bother me anymore. <laughs> and that usually also means that I've lost interest in some way like it, it does not engage me anymore and there's a kind of like release of it like it's just done there's nothing else for me to do but um i also want to demystify all of that a little bit um and say that just you, you you know people like to glamorize what it is that artists do a big part of what artists do is to just be alive it has to do with how you talk to your child or your partner or what you eat that day or what you happen to see when you're well sometimes i walk in my neighborhood and I'm, I'm people put things out like books on stoops in brooklyn and i have this kind of game that i play with myself where i'll go for a walk or walk two miles or 10 miles and i'll anticipate what book might what might be on somebody's stoop and there, there's a real sort of like relinquishing of control but it actually opens up the way that I think by it being something that I can't control. And so these very mundane things that are just about being in the world um, are where I personally start. Um, and so sometimes it doesn't even look like a start. And I, I, I'm saying that because I think that there's a curiosity sometimes when, when an artwork is done, there's a, a, a kind of desire to make it have a beginning and an end, but it doesn't really work like that in real life. 
you know, sometimes absolutely nothing gets done in the studio. Sometimes nothing happens at all. There's nothing to point to. So it's a very personal process, and it would turn us back to the other question, is that you really have to know yourself. You have to know when to just sit with something, when to just listen to something, when to just not touch something. I think we should end there, because this is Teresita's show. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone.